Welcome to another edition of Inside Medicine. I am your host, Doug Geinzer, and we're here in the studio today with Vance Farrow from the Governor's Office of Economic Development and Dr. John Grossmith from the Bonatti Spine Institute. For those of you that are new to Inside Medicine, we broadcast live every Friday at 10 o'clock uh, Pacific time. And you're able to chat live with us here in the studio by visiting vegasvideonetwork.com slash live. And Inside Medicine is a weekly program that brings in the movers and shakers of medicine, those in the know, those that are doing innovative things around the world of uh, medical education, medical innovation, medical developments, uh, and just great things that are happening right here in Las Vegas. So welcome to the studio, Vance and Dr. Grossmith. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, hey, good morning. Happy to be here. Good morning. Happy Friday to everybody. Indeed. So, so Vance, hey, you know, let's get started with, tell us a little bit about the Governor's Office of Economic Development. Some of our viewers, our, our viewership, there are a lot of folks in the healthcare space, uh, physicians, economic developers, healthcare administrators. Tell us a little bit about the Governor's Office of Economic Development. Sure. So our office was created um, after the, or I should say, in the 2011 uh, legislature, mm -hmm. um, right in response to the economic downturn, uh, AB 449 was the uh, bill that both created and funded GoEd, as we call it. And in its creation, several sectors were identified uh, that would assist in diversifying our state's economy, uh, health and medical services being one of them, uh, aerospace and defense, uh, IT, natural resources, et cetera, et cetera. And for each of those sectors, there is an industry specialist. And I am the industry specialist for health and medical services. And our executive director, uh, Steve Hill, uh, champions uh, the entire uh, effort uh, of GoEd. Okay. And so a lot of this spawned from what we all know as the Brookings Institute SRI report. Right. Is that what I initially identified those core areas that we should be diversifying our economy into? That's correct. So uh, it was a complete study that was done that looked at how can Nevada diversify its economy? What are the strengths uh, that the state can build on uh, such that we are less dependent on any one particular industry. Mm -hmm. And so those were identified, and um, they have grown and multiplied in a lot of avenues and areas, and so we're very, very, very proud of where we are today. Sure, and so you're the healthcare specialist. What does your job entail, and what, how did healthcare hit the radar screen? What, what made healthcare important uh, to the Governor's Office of Economic Development? Well, healthcare is important because when you look at the job trend of healthcare as a sector, there's no bubble. Mm -hmm. Even through the economic downturn, there was a steady growth in, in jobs uh, and good paying jobs. Uh, and so health and medical services sector was certainly identified as an opportunity for growth. Uh, and we also have um, health professional shortages within that sector. And so to specifically target uh, this sector, um, and grow it, we knew that we had room for expansion, we knew we had room for growth, not just from the aspect of job creation, but also from the aspect of workforce development, mm -hmm. uh, the pipelines that needed to be uh, not just created, but some of them needed to be expanded. Um, so that's one component uh, of my job, working with Dieter and a lot of the folks that um, do job training, uh, but then also the Nevada System of Higher Ed uh, and all of the institutions uh, that train and, and, and educate uh, our folks that for, for, for job preparedness, uh, but then also to assist local businesses in their expansion and also help other businesses outside of Nevada that are looking to relocate and create uh, a presence in the Southwest. So physician recruitment, it's obviously a little bit important, and we're gonna, here to talk today about uh, expedited licensure, physician recruitment to the state. Why is that so important out of the Governor's Office of Economic Development? When you think about uh, the recruitment uh, of physicians, there's there's a few key things that uh, really hit when it comes to economic development. One of those is um, what's called a uh, location quotient. Mm -hmm. And when you th talk about a location quotient, you're talking about how Nevada compares per capita to the rest of the United States. And we are deficient in physicians, and so the more physicians we're able to recruit, the better we're able to uh, substantiate that location quotient, if you will. But secondary to that, when you bring in a recruit a physician, there's an immediate economic development impact 
uh, at a baseline of about a million dollars and up. Mm-hmm. And what that means is, is when that individual relocates to Nevada, gets licensed and begins practicing, they 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 have that economic development impact because they're going to buy a home, they're going to spend money on goods and services, they're going to hire individuals, they're going to go to restaurants, they're going to spend money, they're going to support other businesses that are located in Nevada. And then that also brings into the point the jobs multiplier. So every physician has a jobs multiplier where they know that they're going to hire so many folks that will work in their office. And then again, you're talking about a ripple effect of economic development at that point. That makes a lot of sense. And I know you did a lot of work in the last session on what we called the expedited licensure bill. And we're going to come back to that in a few minutes. Uh, But in the meantime, we're going to turn to Dr. Grossmith. Dr. Grossmith, uh, you're the newest neurosurgeon to the state of Nevada and specifically to Las Vegas. So welcome to the area. Thank you very much. Happy to be here and Seems like a really great destination to be living in. Yeah, so tell us a little bit about your background. You've got such an esteemed background. We're so proud to have you here in Las Vegas. Tell us a little bit about your medical training and uh, and, and how you got to where you are. Okay, so I think most of my life was spent with the uh, military, and so I started in uh, different positions and evolved to uh, medicine. And uh, basically that career or span of time was from 1969 to 2006. And uh, the service uh, for which I entered the medical corps was the Navy. And I was uh, given the opportunity to to train in neurosurgery full-time out service in uh, Detroit at Henry Ford Hospital. Mm -hmm. And after that, I was assigned to uh, Naval Medical Center San Diego. And when I arrived, I was able to uh, progress from uh, being a staff neurosurgeon to become the chairman of the Department of Neurosciences, uh, in which we uh, also had a a head injury program, uh, collaborated with the uh, VA, and uh, we also became a a DOD uh, center of excellence in which we grew our staff, and we were able to bring in uh, physiatry, neuropsychology, the sleep lab, and so it was a desired destination for uh, many military uh, people. And as you know, during that time, uh, that center uh, took care of uh, uh, several, uh, over a million uh, patients, uh, 1.4 million and about 12,000 surgeries a year with 30% of the staff deployed to uh, the Middle East. Wow. So as the former chairman of neurosciences at the Naval Medical Center in San Diego, What did that entail? It entailed a lot of work in which uh, you had to uh, collaborate and uh, be able to justify uh, funding uh, Mm -hmm. during some very uh, stringent economic times as far as funding from the government. So we had to become efficient and we had to be very directed in our care and basically uh, have the ability to manage our funds such that we could provide maximum care to the uh, maximum number of patients because not only did we care for the uh, active duty, uh, we also had uh, the retirees uh, who were able to have services at the Naval Medical Center. Sure. And at the same time, you were the principal investigator for the Defense Veteran Brain Injury Center. Tell us a little bit about that and what did that all involve? I think the uh, main issue at the time was the uh, head injuries uh, associated with uh, what was going on at the time. So even though uh, a lot of the soldiers, sailors that were injured appeared physically to be not uh, as damaged, their behavior may have changed. And so the results of some of these IEDs or uh, concussive events uh, did in fact uh, show changes in neuropsychological testing. And so some of these... uh, that were serving in, the, for instance, in the Marine Corps, who would be uh, stellar performers, uh, would return with some behavior changes that made their performance look uh, less than sterling. And it wasn't their fault. It was uh, actually you could see evidence that, yes, there were some uh, changes. And those that were involved in some of those blasts, which were pretty potent, uh, mm-hmm. would create some of those problems that you don't necessarily see on imaging studies. So with the neurosciences department being based in San Diego, but treating patients all around the world, I imagine you have uh, quite a bit of experience in telemedicine as well. 
Yes, I was able to communicate to different locations, and uh, the Navy was uh, doing a good job allowing uh, broadband width, so we could actually have some instrumentation on the uh, other end and able to support other providers uh, who were removed from uh, any form of uh, neurosurgical intervention. So in that sense, I think uh, the, the government was doing a good job in uh, telemedicine early on. I think that's another area that you could help us out with here in uh, Nevada. I know Vance has been very involved in telemedicine, and it's an area that we want to pursue in a very big way, and uh, I think your expertise could assist us a little bit. So you're the new, newest neurosurgeon in Las Vegas, and you recently went through the state licensure process. Talk to us a little bit about that experience and uh, how that worked out. Well, I'd have to say that uh, I thought I was well supported by uh, Georgianne Crowley, who was uh, assisting me with credentialing, and Miss Brandy Harrison, the uh, licensure department. Uh, I thought they were very professional and kept me on track as far as what the needs were, so I was kept informed. I'd say it was a very thorough uh, uh, look into my background training, uh, so they did want uh, good detailed explanations of uh, different parts of uh the application, but once uh, everything was assembled, and oftentimes it was delayed because of other states sending mm -hmm. in information, uh, I think once they received all the information, I think, thought it went pretty rapidly, like within days, a couple of days. Yeah, I heard uh, that uh, they were waiting on one piece of documentation. I want to say it was from Nebraska, uh, a locum's <laughs> license, and they got that on a Monday, and by Thursday, you were licensed. So that was less than 72 hours. That's huge for Nevada. Right. Absolutely. So I think it was a very good screening as far as, you know, ensuring that you are who you are, you trained where you trained. And so it's, it, to me, it struck me as that the uh, state's interested in uh, uh, attracting high quality uh, physicians. Yeah, that's, that's our focus here. You know, it's, we've got a big demand for physicians in the marketplace. We want to attract the best of the best. Obviously you fit that fold and it's good to hear that our board of medical examiners is thorough. We want them to be as thorough as they possibly can to make sure that we only attract the best out here. And it's, it's great to hear the, the good work that they're doing. Uh, you know, we had some horror stories in the past and I think the past is the past. We need to talk about the future. And I think that they've got a new executive team up there. They're doing amazing work. And to hear that they were able to get you fully licensed in 72 hours, uh, we can't ask for better than that. Uh, it's been a, a great thing. So, Vance, let's jump over to the expedited licensure bill. Uh, and a lot, I think that bill was passed uh, because of some of these hang-ups before in the past. And, I, and obviously, you see the benefit of uh, licensing people a little bit quicker. And this year, you carried forward a couple bills. And they were bills that, I think there was one that was carried forward back in 2013 that didn't quite make it. Yeah. And then uh, this year, you had two of them get passed. So tell us a little bit about those two bills. So um, AB89 and SB68 uh, both deal with expedited licensure. Um, one is particularly focused on veterans and their spouses, and the other is for uh, a variety of health professionals that are simply looking to relocate to Nevada. And the idea would be that um, each of the boards would be able to license within uh, a period of 60 days. Um, we we question, you know, we asked questions at the beginning to find out if that was a fair and equitable time. Mm -hmm. uh, and we and, and I'd be remiss if I didn't say that all of the boards that we worked with were extremely cooperative uh, and we were very pleased uh, at, at, at our responses. Uh, but in, in putting the, the legislation together, um, we wanted to make sure that uh, we didn't attempt to take any power away from the boards that wasn't the intent sure the only intent was to sort of streamline the process and ask questions that could get us to a point where if we perform x y and z and make sure that everything is is within uh the package that that would be able to be done in an expedited time and uh per dr grossman's experience that time was less than 72 hours which you know is pretty awesome when you look at how things can work at their best. Yep. And I think that, uh, you know, that was just amazing. And I believe that uh, both in the assembly and the Senate, we had unanimous, uh, unanimous uh, approval. And so that would just goes to show that uh, everybody wanted to see this done and that um, it's, 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 it's the way that we're going to proceed moving forward. We actually had to 
um, turn away a handful of boards because uh, LCB couldn't get the language uh, incorporated in time. And what happened in the previous session, we got timed out. And as session was coming to an end uh, in, in, in 15, I was kind of nervous that, you know, we would time out again. And so sure. we, we literally had to say, all right, we're going to have to work with what we have and we can always take on more boards that want to be a part of the legislation down the road, but let's get something done and let's get. So this is not just physician licensure, it's medical licensure. So who were some of those other boards that joined on to that bill? Sure. So we had the allopathic physicians for sure. Mm -hmm. The osteopathic physicians, uh, podiatry, nursing board is involved. Um, We've got a litany of, boards that deal with uh, counseling and therapy. Mm-hmm. So our psychology, uh, speech and audio, uh, marriage counseling, uh, drug and alcohol counseling. I mean, there's a long Very line of folks right that are all, yeah, because behavioral health professionals, we need we need those uh, in leaps and bounds as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so we were looking at it from the standpoint of what's our, where are our state's needs and how do we incorporate those boards such that we're able to expedite those that are looking to come here mm-hmm. because we have the greatest need. That's amazing. It's it's wonderful to see our state come together. We thank you for all of the work that you put in uh, because I know we've been trying to get this passed for many, many years and we got it done this year and it's a, a huge, uh, a huge accomplishment. So Dr. Grossmith, ta- let's go back and let's talk about Bonatti Spine Institute. Uh, amazing facility based out of Hudson, Florida. Uh, you've done 50,000 cases down there. That's a lot of cases. Uh, why Las Vegas? What attracted the Bonatti Spine Institute to expand to Las Vegas? The main issue is geography for the patients since they travel from every state as well as uh, from other foreign countries. So in order to accommodate travel uh, where it was shortened, uh, we thought this was a great destination because it was set up for hospitality and it was a uh, easy in and out kind of uh, city for patients to travel. So medical tourism, I believe, is the term that's used mm-hmm. here. And in addition, it appeared that the uh, thinking out here was uh, business friendly. So it appeared that uh, we would have support if we decided to come to Las Vegas. And many of the patients that would travel to see me, say, from Alaska or or Canada, like the western provinces of British Columbia, Alberta, or Hawaii, California, uh, instead of Hudson, Florida, north of Tampa, uh, being able to come to Las Vegas is a much uh, nicer, shorter uh, flight. Sure, sure. So uh, how long have you been working at the Bonatti Spine Institute? Eight years. And... uh, Basically, during that period of time, for myself, I, I've performed about 3,500 cases. Wow. So we had Dr. Bonatti on the program a couple weeks ago, and he called you his number one guy. He said, I'm going to send my number one guy out to Las Vegas because I want the best out there, and we want to make sure that this uh, expansion is the biggest success. What motivated you personally to relocate out here from Florida? Well, I think that, uh, number one, access for the patients was a a big factor. Uh, And also, as far as in the terminology win-win, I think for myself, uh, many of our family members live in California, so proximity. So instead of flying out on a Friday night uh, to California, come back Sunday night to go to the OR on Monday, no, it's much more uh, uh, close. Uh, and it's a big and beautiful family from the photo that we have up there on the screen. Okay, so, so that was one of the gatherings congratulations. around uh, <laughs> the Christmas time. But yes, uh, and then there are more uh, grandchildren now as well. So basically, it's uh, proximity on the personal side, but also it's a great uh, solution for the uh, patients that want to have access to the Bonatti Spine Institute, the yep. procedure. So you've been in town a couple months. I think you uh, secured a house out here at the Lakes area. So what what do you think of Las Vegas and Nevada so far? Well, I think it has everything you'd want. Uh, so it's attracted uh, all the variety of uh, things that you would uh, think of as far as, you know, food, restaurants, housing. Uh, and basically it's an alive, uh, dynamic environment. And I think the attitude here is for growth. And uh, it appears to be uh, business friendly. So I, th- I think it's going to be a great success to be able to 
uh, open up our facility and uh, start treating the patients. We're excited to have you here. Obviously, a facility that's attracted 50,000 patients there from all around the country and, frankly, all around the world. Uh, that's a that's a coup, and that fits right in with our medical tourism efforts. We've been working very closely with the governor's office, uh, the LVCVA, UNLV, the LVGEA, a bunch of acronyms to develop a strategic plan for medical tourism. And we're two years into it, getting ready to release our uh, two-year accomplishments report. But, Vance, tell us a little bit about uh, medical tourism and how it fits into uh, the econ- the governor's office of economic development. Sure. So, Medical tourism is is one of the components uh, of the health and medical sector, uh, as you've said, that offers us opportunity for growth. With the number of visitors uh, that we have on an annual basis, you know, folks come in town for a variety of reasons, whether it's shows or or or, or to gamble or just to vacation or have fun. Uh, but then also looking at our from healthcare perspective, uh, the number of spas that we have, the number of providers that we have, specialties. Um, those can be maximized uh, if folks take the opportunity to brand them in a way that makes it palatable to 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 the patient. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that you know, to your point, um, if you're traveling all the way to Florida for a procedure and Las Vegas makes it you know easier on you for whatever reason, then why not shorten that trip and come here? Um, your family can be occupied and doing great things and having fun and you can, you know, get your procedure done and go back home feeling good. Seems like a natural. It does seem like a natural. Now so you're, you're trying to attract more companies here. You and I the other day talked about a, I think it was a, a, a med bio or a, a, some type of conference that was coming in right. and you're going to travel and you're going to sell them on Nevada. And actually, I think we just brought up a, an image of a oh, brochure nice. that we hand out there. So tell us a little bit about your efforts to recruit companies from out of state to relocate here. Sure. So we'll be attending the uh, Bio International Conference in June. Uh, it's the world's largest biotechnology conference. And we will be leading uh, a delegation of Nevada companies, uh, as well as our universities, uh, to bio. Um, go ahead, Scott. The state of Nevada has a uh, very large booth uh, in the exhibit space, and we're going to set up one-on-one partnering meetings. Um, so those will be for UNR, UNLV, DRI, uh, as well as uh, the business delegation that will be um, accompanying us on the trip. The whole idea would be that we want to showcase Nevada's assets, and we want to create as many public-private partnerships, MOUs, investors, business uh, opportunities as we can as we present those assets uh, to the world of biotechnology. Uh, we have supercomputing power. We have analysis. We have uh, workforce development programs. We have PhD programs, all within that sphere. Uh, and so we want to showcase that and see what we can what we can put together, and then recruit more of that investment into Nevada. So I'm going to put together a little plug right now for Las Vegas Heels and a group that we have coming up um, on October 18th. We're going to be hosting Healthcare Trends. Uh, which brings together the investment community, the development community, uh, as well as the healthcare community to look at where those opportunities are, where those gaps are, and what we could do to fuel more growth here in town. Obviously, we want to attract more groups like the Bonatti uh, Spine Institute. We're very proud of them coming into town. I want to get back to what makes Bonatti Spine Institute unique. There's something that you do that attracts 50,000 patients. That's a high volume. What is that uniqueness, Dr. Grossmith? Well, in one word, hope would be one answer because many of the patients that arrive are not the uh, person that just herniated a disc. Many of them have been to multiple centers. I won't name names of centers, but let's just say they've had several procedures, if not a fusion Uh, pain pump, pain stimulators, and as a result uh, of those procedures still have the problem, still have a back pain problem or pain extending into the arm or the leg or wrapping around the chest. So the focus for uh, the Bonatti Spine Institute is cervical thoracic lumbar spine non-fusion intervention in which it's targeted as far as precisely targeted to where the problem is localized and using Dr. Bonatti's patented uh, instrumentation, uh, go to that location and perform the decompression while the patient is under IV conscious sedation so that the patient can, in fact, respond 
however, is kept comfortable so it's not an agonal pain procedure. And those that are nervous or anxious, the medications are controlled to maintain uh, the patient in a calm state. But the beauty is, after that decompression is completed, uh, I oftentimes will say, okay, what do you do to create your problem? And they'll have some kind of thing, a twist, a turn, uh, arching, getting on my knees. So in the OR, we'll allow that motion, and the answer is it's gone. Wow. So we've got an image up here on the screen. So looking at there, you've got a device in your hand for the users or the viewers that are not uh, attuned to surgical procedures. What are you doing here? Okay. So since it is a uh, very small opening, uh, about the size of a dime, all the uh, communication down to the surgery site is through a tube that's hidden by our hands. So it's a Mm dime-sized tube that's hidden. So you're performing major surgery through that, so like the cylinder in a car engine. However, the size of that cylinder is shrunk down to the size of a dime. So as a result of that, the disruption to the pathway down to the area of the spine affected is minimal because you're dilating the tissue. You're not tearing, you're not burning, and you're landing on the area where the problem is. Through that, We pass that scope, which in the right hand is the black camera sticking up with a cable, and that projects onto a screen, heads-up display. Mm -hmm. And through that, uh, in the left hand, is an instrument that bites bone. So it's not just a laser procedure, so we're not just using the energy of a laser. The laser, for example, would burn at, say, 3,000 degrees and maybe a quarter millimeter radius, Uh, Maybe it'll get up to 3,000 degrees thereabouts. If you were to use that to try to just get down to the spine, we'd probably both be retired and dead. So it's a precise instrument in just one of them, and that comes in handy when, for instance, you have some disc or material scar around the spinal cord. So to have that precise control of energy to remove that area of compression is where the laser would be helpful. But Many other conditions are compression because of, and fill in the blank on that, and because of tissue, because of thickened ligament, calcified ligament, because of growth of bone encroaching on the spinal canal, spinal cord, or exit for the nerve root. So basically, uh, some of the responses from the patients would be something like, yeah, they said the fusion looked good and da-da-da-da, but I still have this pain. And so the challenge becomes, okay, we have to remove the instrumentation, so metal screw parts of the rod, then get into the bone fusion mass, then travel down to where the anatomy is being affected. So that's why it's very, uh, very potent as far as you get better from that, and you've been having this problem for years, you tend to tell other people, and as a result of that, more people come. Sounds great. So anyway, doctor, I, I want to thank you for being on the show today. We're The show's coming to a close here in a few minutes, and uh, Vance, I want to thank you for uh, being on, on, on the show today. And uh, for those users or viewers that are out there, uh, we broadcast live here every single Friday at 10 o'clock Pacific time. You're able to communicate with us via chat. Next week, we've got another unique episode of Inside Medicine. We're going to do a recap of our uh, healthcare happy hour that we're hosting on May 5th, which is Cinco de Mayo. It's going to be held at the Spanish Hills Wellness Center. Uh, This is a brand new skilled nursing facility that's built here in Las Vegas, right in line with our medical tourism efforts. It's not grandma's nursing home. This is a place that looks like a resort that you would find on the Las Vegas Strip, allows patients to recover uh, in luxury, and we're going to have some of the leadership from the Spanish Hills Wellness Center right here on the show next Friday, uh, talking about the evening before. Those that weren't able to attend will be able to take a virtual tour of the center and learn a little bit more about that. In the meantime, thank you all for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you next Friday. And again, you could find us live on uh, VegasVideoNetwork.com slash live, or if you miss the show, you could always go to LasVegasHeels.org and watch the show there. Thank you, and have a great week.